You're tuned in to CSBC TV. Welcome to Cogden Street Baptist Church in Providence, Rhode Island, where everybody's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything's possible. We are live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We are so happy you are tuned in today. Welcome home. You are in a community of dreamers, innovators, doers, and change agents. You are somebody. Thank you for tuning in today. To all our special guests, welcome home. We would love to connect with you. Please connect with us. Use your phone and scan the QR code or text CSBC JOIN to 84576. Welcome home. Here's something in the sermon you like, praising God to a song, laughing at our funny jokes. Feel free to use your handy dandy church response kit on the screen. Use emojis and comments during worship. We're glad you're tuned in. Spiritual development is at the core of what we do at Cognitive Street. We offer a variety of ways to engage with through community and various technological means. Here are some ways to get connected this week. Black Christian Ministry, College Group, Monday at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Young Adult Bible Study Group, Monday at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Conference Call Bible Study, Tuesday at noon on Conference Call. Thursday Bible Study, this week live on Zoom at 7 p.m. To get connected to any and all of our small groups and Bible studies, simply go to cognanstreet.org backslash group or email m-b-a-z-i-l-e at cognanstreet.org. This Tuesday, join us for our midweek programming, CSBC Life, where we take a moment to dive into well-being, fitness, and general laughter as a community. Tune in on Facebook and YouTube at 7 p.m. This Friday, join us for our first Fridays, our unplugged midweek worship experience with music, poetry, dance, and more. Attendance is limited to the first 10 people who sign up. March 1st Friday has been shifted to the second Friday, March 12th. Sign up at CogdenStreet.org. Guess what? We're baptizing. Is baptism your next step? Do us a favor and visit cogdenstreet.org backslash Easter to sign up or text Yes Jesus to 84576. We are excited about your next step. Don't forget next weekend to spring forward your clocks. Leap ahead one hour on your clocks as we get ready for what God has in store for the spring. That's all that's coming down your street this week. As you can tell here at CSBC, we dream, innovate, do, and change. If you need to connect with us, be sure to call 401-421-4032. You can email us at info at CogdenStreet.org. You can find all church information online at CogdenStreet.org. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay up to date and check out our podcast on iTunes and Spotify. We'll see you next Sunday. This will be your best week. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Cognitive Street's virtual online service. We are so excited that you are here today. My name is Courtney, and I am honored to host today's worship service. I'm so glad that you are here, um, and it's not by accident that you have stumbled or have come to this side of the internet. We know that the steps of a righteous man or woman are ordained by the Lord, and so we are so happy to welcome you into our community today. Hey, listen, one of the things that COVID has done is taken away our ability to celebrate each other in a meaningful way. We have so many wonderful things happening in our community, happening in our families, with people around us, even in our church. And I'm gonna shout out some of those in a, in a little bit. But I wanna give you a chance to shout out some good things. So grab your phone, go to whether Facebook, YouTube, wherever you're watching the stream, and I want you to write in the chat something good that is happening. Whether that's your fellow church member, someone in your small group, 
someone in the church that you know are doing good, something that you're doing that you just want to shout out and that we can celebrate. I refuse. COVID has stolen so much from us this year. It's stolen over 500,000 lives um, over the past year. Things have been looking bleak, things that have been happening. We've had windstorms and um, Arctic blasts in the South and people not being able to get the ample food that they need. And I refuse to let the enemy or anything of such take away our ability to celebrate each other. So I have some good news. I, I want to celebrate a day. If you guys don't know, she's doing pivotal work in maternal health and working with black moms and black women um, as it pertains to giving birth. And she was published in Glamour Magazine. Yes, check it out, Glamour Magazine. Our very own Donald was accepted into Wheeler, an exceptional school, uh, because he is so gifted, young, talented, and black. Um, a lot of our members are healthy. They are strong. What else? Give me some good news. What are some good news? Uh, Latricia has her sweet, sweet baby girl, Marianne. We are so excited um, that we get to welcome another member into our community. Hi, Marianne, if you're watching that today. Our students are growing strong and smarter. We have students going to college, being accepted into multiple colleges. Congratulations, Jazzy. We are so happy that you, the world is your oyster and you get to choose where you wanna go. There's a number of things that have been happening good in our community. This not just for Black History Month from this past February, where we get to honor the accomplishments of Black people, but even as we go into this month and we honor women and we honor all the things that we are still continuing to do. That's the whole idea of Black Future Month and Black Futurism, honoring where we are going and what we are doing today. So listen, I love seeing all the good things that are happening. I love how God has brought you out. I love how God has sustained your family. I love how God has healed your body. I love it all. I love how God gave you that house. This is so amazing how he gave you that scholarship, how he woke you up this morning. You're just so happy to see today. Some of you, it's a, an amazing challenge just to be on this live stream today and you're commenting. I see you, Sister Betty. I love your name on here. Just keep commenting and keep going. Listen, if God did it for your community member, if God did it for your brother, your sister, your cousin, guess what? He will absolutely do it for you. So I know if you're down and out right now, that God will always know exactly where you're at. And it's such a, an amazing ability to celebrate each other. So in that light, I'm super excited that we get to worship together. Another great way before we jump into our praise and worship that we can worship together is through tithes and offerings. How many of us look, and as Pastor Justin goes into God cares about your money more than you do, how many of us see giving as a joy? Well, guess what? It's an absolute ability to be able to give freely from our heart with joy so that we can impact our community in my ways. Listen, there are multiple ways that you can give. The first and the most convenient and secure way is to give online at CompassStreet.org. You simply click, go on the website, click give, and there's two options. You can give on Apple or PayPal. Both are secure and convenient ways to give. You may always want to lend your tithes and offering to the church at 17 Cogman Street here in Providence, Rhode Island, or you can stop by and drop it off at the church at any time. We would love to say hi to you. Whatever is easier for you, we are here to accommodate. Listen, it's about your heart when you give. It's about putting it in the right perspective when you give. God will see, it's a, it's a faith step, and God will honor that. Why don't you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you, God, for the gift and the ability to give. We thank you for what you're about to do with this faith step. We thank you for what you're about to do with this seed. God, we ask you that as I plant this, as we plant this together, that you water it and do what you need to do to a hungry and dying community. Thank you for all the good in our community. Thank you for all the good in who we are. Thank you, God, for creating the good in us. We love you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
it is offering time. Hey, remember, you don't have to wait until this moment to give. You can give all throughout the week. Um, it's open and available to you, so you don't have to wait for this time. So I hope you are ready to go into worship. I hope you are ready to dive into it. Um, get in a great worship stance, get comfortable, grab a family member, and let's worship together. Take it away. Good morning, Connie My name is Donald Young. I would like to welcome you all. Let's open up with prayer. Amen. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful thing to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The most beautiful rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. Most beautiful, 
Jesus. We thank you that your love grows sweeter and sweeter and sweeter and sweeter and sweeter with time, Lord God. We give you thanks that you've extended your love. We all care about money. We care about how much we spend, how much we save. We care about how much we make. And we most assuredly care about how much we don't make. But what if I told you that you're not the only one who cares about your money? God cares. In fact, God cares more about your money than you do. beginning a brand new series today um, entitled God Cares About Your Money More Than You Do. And uh, this first week is, our title is A Godly Perspective on Money. A link is going to come up in your comment section. For those of you who are just tuning in, my name is Justin. I'm privileged to serve as a pastor here at Congdon Street Baptist Church up on the hill in College Hill, uh, where we are, um, see our vision, you guys know what to do at the end. We are a community of Christ-led dreamers, innovators, doers, and active agents of change. We create spaces to learn about Christ. We radically challenge each other to live in communion with Christ. And we are continuously pressed to lead others to Christ. Somebody say learn, somebody say live, and someone say lead. That's who we are, what we do, and that's how we do it, right? That we learn, we live, and we, we lead. And so um, when, we, when we talk about anything, it's getting back to our vision. And we have a 2030 vision um, to remind you of that keeps us focused. A lot of the things, the great things, that we were able to do last year and even doing this year are all a part of our 2030 vision. And we're, we, uh, vision, is, vision is the foreseeable future given to those who trust in God. Vision is the foreseeable future given to those who trust in God. So we, and we write the vision, make it plain. So we wrote a 2030 vision the Lord gave us in 2019 to plan the next 10 years of the congregation. And, uh, and, and we've been able to enact so many things in that 2030 vision. And uh, I'm excited to share with you about Easter actually at the end of worship. That got, got to keep tuned in. Uh, we'll have communion following the sermon. Um, but I'm excited to talk about Easter as well and what we're going to do for Easter and how Easter is going to be executed in excellence. Hallelujah. But we also then need you. Excellence executed with community. Excellence is executed with community. Excellence is executed. And you cannot execute amazing excellence individual by yourself. Excellence is executed in community. And, um, and it's also celebrated in community as well. So um, we'll do that at the end. But this time we're jumping into a godly perspective of money. Now um, there's a link that's going to take you online. There's a moment at the end of worship after everything is done. Courtney's going to come back actually at the way end of worship um, after we do our benediction and everything and actually have a section called talk it over. And this talk it over moment is going to be a chance to actually have conversation with you about what we talked about. And um, as we continue to figure out things here, we're going to do more of those live in a living color with you as well. Like this Wednesday's, this Thursday, Bible study is that. Um, so let's jump into the Word of God. I want to begin by getting into money by talking about Lent. I want to I want to use Lent in conversation with uh, with money, if you will. So the thing about Lent, I want to be very clear about this. The thing about Lent is that Lent's purpose is to create a lifestyle. I want you to put that in your notes. By the way, 
this is a note-taking series. This is a note-taking series. So get your journal. Those of you who didn't get your journal, go get your journal, go get whatever it is, or get, get, put, the, put the thing, stream it to your TV, and then go get some. This is a note-taking series, all right? Um, the, the Lent's purpose is to create a lifestyle. Um, Lent, the reason that we celebrate it and the reason we honor it is a lot of times it's something that was created by the church to imitate what Jesus did. Um, church fathers and church leaders started and embarked on Lent as a, as a way to imitate the time that Jesus spent in the wilderness. But I want us to remember that when Jesus spent time in the wilderness, he was tested by Satan, right? So, so going into Lent, he was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit and was tested by Satan. And in the end, what it was, it was a testing of Jesus's purpose, of testing of what God, what Jesus had, 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 had vocalized, what John had prophesied, and what the Holy Spirit had found rest in when the dove rested on Jesus. And so Lent is not just something we do to stop on social media to eat some fish, because now we're seeing marketing and capitalism play into Lent, right? So you see these places that are having certain meals and certain things, because um, you, have, you have some people who are great, sinners that are just great Christians on Lent, right? And just, for, and, 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 we, and we've manipulated it that we, it's 40 days, but if you count the days, it excludes Sunday. So I can do whatever, I, I abstain from it from Monday through Saturday, and I just do whatever I want on Sunday. I'm a glutton on Sunday, and I get back into it. The purpose of Lent is so that when Lent is over, it's a new lifestyle. Lent creates a lifestyle. I want you to, want you to get that in your notes, say Lent creates a lifestyle. Lent creates a lifestyle. So if you are going into Lent, and you're saying, hey, I'm going to get rid of social media. And as you get rid of social media, when, and you're just, you're just, I need, I, need, I need my Facebook. I need, to, I need to check what everybody else is doing. I need to scroll through somebody else. If you're, if you're looking, Dave Chappelle, those of you who watch Dave Chappelle, if you're looking for a way to get back onto socials, then we got to check your lifestyle. I hope you all come back and talk to me. If we're looking for means to engage in, in, in if you gave up certain types of food, it's creating a lifestyle. Because here's what it does. And when we talk about testing, it's not God doesn't test us because God doesn't like us. Here's what God does. I want to take the word testing and allow me to replace it with the word stretching. Right. Anytime you are living on purpose, God will stretch you to test your capacity and to test your trust. That's so good. That's so good. I'm, I'm going to say it again. I said anytime you're living on purpose, God will test you, will stretch you to test your capacity and stretch your capacity and to test your trust and to stretch your trust. Don't believe me. Look at Matthew chapter four. Look at what happened to Jesus in Matthew four. I don't, I'm not, this is kind of, this is my intro into the text. Jesus was tempted by Satan. He was tested by Satan. He was stretched by Satan three times. Look what he was. Number one, Satan tells Jesus, I want you, number one, I want you to turn these stones into bread. Then he says, I want you to throw yourself down to test God. Number three, he says, I want you to worship me and I'll give you everything, right? To me, what's powerful, I could get into like the testing. What's powerful is the way that the devil framed the question. Um, you guys heard me say this before. Did you ask a question today? The devil asked a really good question. He said, if you be the son of God, the power to me is where you place the emphasis. If you are the son of God, if you be, if you are the son of God, and if you are the son of God, like where you put the, because one is a question of your purpose, if you are the son of God. One is a question of your being, if you be the son of God. And one is a question of your connection to your divinity, if you be the son of God. That's what Lent tests. It creates a lifestyle so that whenever Satan wants to test it, he can, it, you're not just abstaining from sin. Sin is not welcome. I hope you all hear me that I want you to get to a place in your Christian faith and your Christian walk where you're not just abstaining from doing a thing, but you are not even welcoming it into your space. Right. That's the power of of Lent. It creates a lifestyle so that you can look back at Satan when he questions your purpose, questions your being and questions the connection to God. If you be who God says you are. Yes, I am. And three times ask me the question and I won't turn my back on God. There's a power in that asking of three times. We see that all throughout scripture. And here's what I want to give you. That Lent sin does not is not welcome in your house. I want you to get past just abstaining and running from, and it's no longer welcome. That's the lifestyle. 
That's the lifestyle change. You're creating a lifestyle. And a lot of us don't have a church problem. We have a Jesus problem. And our Jesus problem is we abstain from things instead of making sure it's not welcome. So you're just, you're walking by it. You don't, you don't, like I said this in our, our, our Bible study a couple of weeks ago. I said, what are you going to do when you're talking about being single and you want, you want to keep yourself pure for marriage? And so and you, want, you don't want to engage in something. You don't want to do something. And so why would you engage in a situation that's going to position you to go against what God has put in, put, called you to do? Is moving from abstinence to it's not even welcome. The thought is not welcome. The move, and if it, if it comes into my space, I then, like Jesus, can, I can name it, that's Satan. I will not be tested by it because that's Satan. And I will not worship it because that's Satan. Right? That Lent sin does not because that's a, that's a lifestyle change. So that's, that's my conversation, if you will. Because I think when we talk about money, we've, we put the wrong language on money. And we put the wrong language. And some of you are sitting here like, oh my God, Pastor Justin, you really are going to talk about money on a live stream sermon. Like, can you just wait till we come back in church so I can just, I can just say I went to church and just didn't listen to the sermon? Like, I don't, want to, I don't want to hear about no money, Pastor, and getting up to Easter. You know what would make your Easter powerful? If you had a great relationship with money, not capitalism, but with money. <laughs> My wife said to me a couple days ago, she said, Justin, you're really, not you're really, she's like, I, I, I applaud you for talking about money. She says, I want you to think about what you preached about recently. First month, you talked about lifestyles. Then you talked about, Uh, sex, and now you're talking about money. The only thing you talk about is drugs. I mean, it's just, we're talking about all this, because here's the thing, if we don't talk about and confront the stigmas, we'll we'll engage in the stigmas, and we we won't address the possibility. And I think we put a really bad perspective on money, and, and that's capitalism, that's greed. Let me tell you this, God did not make money to be what money has become, but greed has made money what money has become. Greed has made money oppressive. Greed has made money manipulative. Greed has made money complicated. God did not create this so that money is frustrating. So I want to spend money, if you will, to look at it from the way that God looks at money. And this is not, at the end of the sermon, let me tell you something, I'm not asking you to give any money. You're not buying me a new suit. I want to be very clear. I ain't even wearing a suit. You're not buying me a new suit. You're not buying me a new car. Ain't no extra offerings. Ain't no Ain't no nothing. But I do want to ask you some questions. I want to engage in the gospel. Can y'all do that with me? All right. So I want you to help me with this. I got some questions for you. I need you to help me in the comments really quick. Got some questions for y'all today. So do me a favor. Here's what I want you to do. First thing, um, get your phones out and get your emojis ready. All right. I have some questions. I need you to answer them. Thumbs up or thumbs down. Right. Thumbs up or thumbs down. Thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay. Number one, how many of you could use some more money? Thumbs up or some thumbs down. Thumbs up. Come on, emojis. How many of you could use some more money? How many of you just use a bad day? I get, I get, if I just had 15 grand, how many, okay, cool. How many of you, Pastor Justin, I ain't got enough money. Thumbs up or thumbs down. I, I just, I ain't got enough money. I wish I had the, mm-hmm. right? How many of you wish you knew just a little bit more about financial literacy and financial engagement and knew a little bit more about money, stocks, bonds, insurance, I mean, how many of you wish you knew just a little bit more about money? Thumbs up, thumbs down. How many of you have been to churches where you had at least six offerings? I just, I just want to see this. You had at least six offerings. You just had like, I don't know, when I was growing up, you had at least six offerings. I'm like, thumbs up or thumbs down, right? Uh, maybe four offerings. I mean, Lord, no, we're going to stay at six. I grew up, we used to have, uh, uh, let's see, we had a, I was in Sunday school, so we had the Sunday school offering. We had our individual class offering. Then we had the larger church school offering, so I had to take three dollars. Um, so I was going to get the VSA, but, but for some reason I thought if they raised them all separately, it'd be changed. But Mom only gave me three dollars. And then we had the, uh, you know, it was the the first offering. It was like benevolence or something. First love offering. Never really knew what that was. We had the benevolent offering, the van offering, the building fund offering, pastor's love offering, usher offering, choir offering, the nursery offering. I don't know. Y'all had some crazy offerings, too. I don't know. I, I grew up with that. It's just multiple offerings, right? Okay, I had to. How many of y'all don't want a series about money? Thumbs up. I'm, I'm just kidding. Don't, don't answer that. Money is fun. But, like, the world we live in right now, money is fun if you have some. So let me ask you this other question. Um, my last question. Have you ever done something stupid with money? Hand, thumbs up or thumbs down? Like, have you ever looked back on a situation and said, man, I really wish I just, I really made a bad decision with money? I want you to shake it off. 
Before we jump into the series, same thing I did at the beginning of our series on sex, I want you to shake off that guilt with money because I don't want you to make decisions out of guilt or shame. I don't want you to think about money as a way of guilt or shame because that's not the way that God looks at money. I want you to shake that guilt off. And let me give you this principle. Let me give you this principle. Here's the first principle I want to give you. You are bigger than your purchases and you are not your purchases, right? You are bigger than your purchases and you are not your purchases. So I'm not going to preach this series and tell you, like, don't go buy the Gucci bag. If you can afford it and it fits in your budget because you have a budget, it fits in your budget, you, have, you, 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 you go purchase it. You are not your purchases, but purchase it. But, and you are bigger than your purchases, right? Um, I remember growing up and uh, I remember seeing what pastors drove all the time. And I remember when I first got here and one time I drove up, I have a, I have a, I have a Camry and I remember when I uh, had my, my, my car, I had leased it and then it was time to continue like to get a new lease or purchase the car I made the decision then to purchase the car and uh, I remember getting here early on my first my first year and a half or so here and uh, someone who um, was visiting our church and was thinking about joining the church came to me one time and said Pat I have a 2012 Camry and so right now it's going to hit 10 years in a couple months and uh, came to me uh, Pastor Justin I would love to join your church oh my gosh I would love for you to be part of the church but I can't have a pastor driving that type of car cool um, okay, I just pastors drive Cadillacs, pastors drive Lincolns, pastors drive X, Y, Z. And, and if you are going to be a pastor here, you've got to understand, you've got to have a big car, a big, big whatever, right? And, and I remember going home to my wife, hey, babe, we got to go search a car because I'm like, this person won't be in if I, if I don't. My wife was like, who's going who's gonna to pay the $700 car payment? Who, who's going, who, is that person going to pay, like, this is, you are bigger than your purchases, and you are not your purchases. Because let me tell you something, the main, your purchases are not your purpose. Your purchases, and I want to address this poverty mindset when it comes to the kingdom. I said this the last time I talked about money. I want us to move from having a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. There is no scarcity. The only time we saw scarcity is when God wiped things out because of sin. I hope y'all hear me. And then we saw scarcity later as Jesus came to dismantle the ways that greed caused scarcity among the people, right? So there is no, Jesus didn't come and take a vow of poverty. Jesus, let's, let's back up. The disciples were attorneys, doctors, tax collectors, lawyers. They were, and carpenters and fishermen. They were the wealthiest group. And that's the reason why when Jesus said, I need, look, look at the sons of Zebedee in Mark chapter 2. When Jesus called the sons of Zebedee, Zebedee was like, hold on, you just... You took two of my greatest employees because fishermen made money. Carpenters were stonemasons. They built houses. They made money. God did not call you to take a vow of poverty when you, when you connected to God. God never called you to live isolated and desolate. God called us to live in abundance. I need you to write that in your notes. God called me to live in abundance. Abundance as defined by God. God called you to live in abundance. And it's amazing that we can pick and choose who has abundance. Even we see that in scripture. We, we look at the covenant of laying down and, 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 and uh, go to Luke chapter 9. Go to Luke, I want to show you one of the scriptures that's often used to say that if you're connected to God, you're taking a vow of poverty. That's why I like it, it's don't pay pastors, don't pay social workers, don't, don't pay nonprofit leaders, don't, don't pay people like that. People that play in churches should never, it, it's foolish. God never called you to live in poverty. He called you to live on purpose. And living on purpose will lead you into abundance as defined by God. I hope you all hear me. God didn't call you to live on poverty. He called you to live on purpose. I'm going to show you this. Go to Luke chapter 9. I'm giving you all scripture this month. There's just a whole lot of scripture. And I hope to encourage you also to, to shift our perspective in our relationship with money. Um, so these sermons may be longer than 30 minutes. All right, Luke chapter 9. Look what it says here. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. It's going to be on your screen too. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and cure diseases. Let's pause here. Purpose. Power and authority to drive out demons and cure diseases. Let me Remember later Jesus says, and you will do greater. Look what he told them they'll do. But power and authority to drive out demons. They called them to proclaim the gospel and heal the sick. And he told them that's their purpose. Because they have their purpose. So what he says is, take, take them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever you, house you stay in, stay there till you leave that town. If people don't welcome you, leave their town, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They set out from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people wherever they went. Look at the text. Jesus is telling his disciples to not take certain things with them. Look what he says, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. 
He's not telling them to be broke. Context. Too often we're reading scripture decontextualized. So context. Jesus was telling them to go forth with humility, with nothing extra on your back, so you can speed up the process of living on purpose. Driving out demons, curing diseases, proclaiming the kingdom of God, and healing the sick. So you don't need the bread, the money. And the reason being, too, is because of the culture of the people. Like, we got to look at the culture. The culture of the East at that time gave them the freedom to not have to bring extra stuff. And not to mention, they had a little need, right? They weren't going around saying, I got to get... Jesus was telling them, don't take anything you don't need, but not to live in poverty. He didn't tell them that, right? The reason is in the East, there was this freedom of hospitality. People would welcome prophets and leaders and disciples into their homes and take care of them. There was a community. There was a care for the people. So now when they go travel, there's a care for them in the community that they had nothing to worry about. So they didn't need to bring bread because the community would take care of them. They didn't need to bring. So now that speeds up the disciple making that if you go share the gospel, they don't want it. You dust your feet off. Keep moving. Next house. Go share the gospel. Don't want it. Dust because they were going from city to city because there was not time to waste because Jesus was looking towards Calvary. They were living on purpose, but they weren't living in poverty. The focus was the gospel. And here's the main principle I want to give you today. Money serves me as I serve God. I I want you to put that in the comments right now. Money serves me as I serve God. I'm I'm trying to help you today. Some of y'all are so uncomfortable that I'm talking about money because you're just waiting for me to raise an offering and I'm not doing it. I want to help our relationship with money. Everybody put this in your journal, in your comments, whatever it is. Money serves me as I serve God. Can you say that with me on your couch? Just say, money serves me. Is that those of you who are watching in your bathroom, come on, money serves me. Come on, as you are wa- cooking your breakfast, listen to this on your Chromecast. Money serves me as I serve God. That's the principle. I want to look at a godly perspective of money. Because if we look at money differently, and for some of you, this is a reminder. You, you, you got it. Kudos to you. For some of you, this is brand new. For some of you, you're waiting for me to make you upset. For some of you, you're waiting for some quotable statement you can put on Instagram. My pastor said this. You ain't going to get that from me. Because here's, here's your quotable. God cares more about your money than you do. And what if you cared about your purpose in God more than you cared about your purchases in the world? That's my goal. I want us to see money never tells me what to do. I tell my money what to do. I'm going to say that again. Money never tells me what decisions to make. I tell my money what I'm going to do. That money will never declare or keep me from the possibility that God has on my life. It is so and not otherwise. And as long as I'm fully serving God, leaning into God, money does not dictate who I am. Go, go, go with me, scripture, to Proverbs 22, verse number 7. Proverbs 22, verse number 7. Proverbs 22, verse 7 says this, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is a servant to the lender. I want you to highlight this. I want you to underline this. The rich rule over the poor, the borrower is a servant to the lender. Um, grab a hold of this text. Um, you can go back up a verse or go down a verse. It's this whole notion of training up a child, and sowing seed. The writer is giving an explanation of what is later described in Proverbs 18 as the way of the world. And there's an advantage to wealth and disadvantages in poverty. Because what the text is showing us that wealth equals power. The latter is service. Thus the text is not trying to harm us, but to challenge us in our competency and avoid the perils of being servants and worshiping wealth. Hear me. The influence of wealth causes us to set aside moral distinctions and moral competency and worship wealth. That's what the text is showing us. And the text sits in the middle of two verses in Proverbs as to what it means to train and what it means to be in bondage, to be tethered to money because you're serving another person, right? So serving somebody else's position in your life, you quit living your own life. I think for some of us, it's kind of how we live. It's kind of how you go to work. You're serving so much of what you think your boss requires of you serving so much of what you think others want you to do, serving so much of what others are thinking about you, that you're tethered to somebody else's thoughts about you because you think they control your paycheck. 
You're tethered to somebody else's thoughts about you. And so you quit living life because you're trying to live for what you assume somebody else wants you to do. Wealth is not a bad thing, but worshiping wealth is. And the reason that some of our bosses and leaders get torn down is because we've created idols out of them. And anything that gets in between you and your relationship with God, God's going to destroy. The word in the text here that's very interesting to me is when the text says the rich rule over the poor, the borrowers are servant to the lender. I'm going to pause before I say this word. There's a lot of slave language in this text. There's a lot of prisoner language in this text and that I'm going to bring up. Um, it is not the same as what we saw to our ancestors. Um, prisoners... In, and being in jail, for example, when Paul was in jail, Paul was just in the basement, windows were open, he was able to hear the hustle and bustle of the streets. That's how he, he got letters from Timothy, he wrote letters to Timothy, he went and visited people. I mean, Paul, when we talk about jail in biblical times, it was a lot different than what we see, um, what we see today in our prison time, capitalism and greed. The same thing when it comes to slavery. The ways that slaves were treated and servants were treated in biblical times is a lot different than what people manipulated to become when that happened here in America and when it happened over across the seas as well. So I want to be very clear. I'm using some slave language and servant language and prisoner language because of what the scripture says, but it is not an oppressive way and not an oppressive thing. Um, it's really, I want to show you the text, right? So the word here in Proverbs 22 is the word ethbed, ethbed. It's a servant or a slave, one who is in bondage. A servant or a slave, one who is in bondage, right? And, and what that means, the reason I'm being particular is I want us to consider the times in our lives where you were in bondage to your money. Um, you, you wanted to live on purpose, you were attempting to live on purpose, but you were tethered to your money. So you were, you were trying to move, but you were tethered to a credit card. And you thought your purpose was going to happen because of a credit card. You were tethered to debt, so you, you can't move forward because debt is holding you back. Payments are holding you back. You're cringing at the gas station line, hoping they didn't get your license plate, and you're driving off as fast as possible because you don't know if the money is actually on your card. You're cringing at grocery checkout lines. I hope it goes through. You're in bondage. I'm, you're in bondage. Your dreams aren't coming true because you're in bondage. You, you love to get married, but you can't afford it. You love to start a family, love to have children, love to have, one at, uh, love to have a home, but you seem to can't find it. You like a little larger house because you don't want to rent your whole life. You, would, you don't like your job. You like to do something else. You, you want to help someone in need. You want to give to a mission trip. You want to give an extra offering. But I'm telling you, money can hold you bondage. And I, at the same time, acknowledge that bondage is a reflection of the world only exacerbated by COVID-19. Let me consider this. I want you to consider 2020 statistics on money this year. I'm going to put these up on the screen, too, because I want you to see this. The average household debt in the United States, as of 2020, the end of 2020, government statistics, is $145,000. Debt payments, for some of us, right, your, your debt in your life, uh, debt payments monthly, are around 10% of your monthly income. I, I want these to sink in. For one person, the average, for one credit card, the average credit card balance for one credit card in America is $5,900. The average balance of one store card, you know, JCPenney, Nordstrom, whatever card, is $2,000. So hear this. The, if you put that in perspective, the average non-mortgage, these are non-mortgage debts, of a Gen Zer has 1.6 credit cards and has over $11,000 in debt, not counting student loans. <clears throat> I want to put that in perspective. You're 18 to 24, 1.6 credit cards with $11,000 of debt. The average millennial has 2.7 credit cards and over $27,000 of debt. This is not student loans, this is non-mortgage. The average Gen Xer, 3.3 credit cards, and $33,000 of debt. And the average boomer, 3.45 credit cards and $26,000 of debt. This is non-mortgage and non-student loan related. But consider that the average revolving credit card balance of just one card for, for, for our Latino and Latina friends, $5,500. And for our black, black, all y'all black folks out here, $3,900. I want to put this in perspective today. I understand. When we talk about money, when we think about our lives right now, this is what we're dealing with. 50% of Americans have less than one month of emergency savings. A lot of us are an uh-oh from being homeless. 28% of us have less than two 
uh, weeks of expenses saved because we're living, well, the reason being is, here's the reason re being, the average number of U.S. households living paycheck to paycheck is 63%. People spend 12 to 18% more when you use a credit card. That gets to the $5,900 of average credit card balance and eleven dollars to $30,000 of debt. And it contributes to our emotional well-being, too. U.S. married couples argue an average of three times per month about their joint finances, and 40 plus, and I can see the numbers here, average, I mean fight, average of four times a month. I want you to see here, church, when we talk about money, we're working to live. We're not working for fun. We talk about purpose. We're not working for fun. This is not, and this is not just everybody, but, this is, but it's 63% of us. We're, we're not working for fun. We're working to live. We're working so that the, when I get a paycheck, so you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting to, to buy something. We're waiting, you're waiting to pay our bills. We're waiting, 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 hoping that when our electricity bill, or our gas bill, or our oil bill, or our internet bill, whatever comes in, or our Netflix bill, or you know, instead of just having cable, because we thought it'd be cheaper to stream, now all the streaming companies are all separate, so you're paying the same amount of money for streaming that you did for cable. I mean, you're just waiting for the bills to come in, you're doing a 30-day free trial and using five different email addresses because I'm worried about what's going to happen on the next bill. It's a grim reality, but here's what I want to show you. A lot of us were tethered and normal is house payments and car payments and student loan payments and credit card payments and sleepless nights and marriage tension and worrying all the above and desiring to travel, desiring to purchase, desiring to live, desiring to move forward, desiring to be all God's called us to be. And, and, and then we get, so we get frustrated when a government doesn't, wants, wants, to, wants, to, wants to oppress even further by arguing over minimum wage increases and oppress even further by giving low stimulus packages when we look across to different countries and see how they've assisted the people living in their country. It's an unfortunate reality. And I'm not saying this as some millionaire. I'm not, I'm not coming to you saying I got it all together. I'm saying this as someone who has student loan debt. I'm saying this as someone who understands these statistics as I'm folding right into them. Money, the reason I'm preaching on this and the way we can heal and budget and desire to budget, here's what it is. Money is one of the most visible measurements of the condition of our heart. The reason I want to talk about this, it's the outward measurement of our inward spiritual condition. And because of capitalism, because of greed, we've gotten away from what Scripture teaches us powerfully about money. Let me tell you this. Two-thirds of the parables deal with money and possessions. Because of greed in those communities and because people just desire to have stuff, and didn't really desire to live on purpose with God. One out of 10 verses in the gospel deal with money. And it deals with it in a way because Jesus is trying to teach us to get to a place, hear me, where you live in abundance so you can give it away, right? So Jesus is giving us the principles, the framework to get to abundance so we can give away, right? 2,300 verses in scripture deal directly with money and possessions. That's five times more than the scriptures that deal on prayer and the scriptures that deal on faith. Money is essential, y'all, when it comes to our relationship with God. Money is, because money, where your treasure is, there's your heart is, and, and the way we handle money, and one of the most outward indicators of the inward condition of our hearts is in our money. And sometimes the reason it becomes weird to talk about it in church is if the only time we talk about money is when we're raising offerings, right? So then we're manipulating or cherry-picking scriptures that, that, that are for the church to raise money, right? And so that becomes, becomes difficult to talk about scripture and money because if the only time I talk about a thing is when I'm trying to get something from you, that's a reason why, church, I'm very particular when it talks about uh, money and tithing in our congregation because if the only time we talk about money is raising money, then our relationship with money, with God, is only going to be recluded to when we're trying to, someone's trying to take money from you in a world where 63% of us are just trying to make it to Monday. Throughout scripture, the money conversation consistently happened. In essence, God was constantly trying to teach us money, to look at money God's way, to see life God's way, to desire to get to a place to see it God's way. And I'm by no means saying at the end of the series or the end of the sermon, you're going to get it together, but I want you, and I'm, I, I'm not going to change capitalism with a sermon series, but I hope to help shift our focus so we don't serve money and we serve God and we see how money serves us 
as we serve God. Am I, are y'all with me still? Can y'all thumbs up or thumbs down? Are y'all with me still? Am I, am I, am I, I know for some of y'all, y'all mad at me because I'm down the street, up the alley, in your kitchen, making Kool-Aid, and, and I'm just pouring some sugar on that thing to try to sweeten it up as much as I can, all right? Let's talk about how we serve money. Um, statistics show we're wrestling with money management, having enough of, of it, desiring more of it, wanting more of it. Scripture said this is part of our heart's posture. Go to Matthew chapter 6. I'm, I'm almost done, actually. Go to Matthew 6. Matthew 6, 1 through 4. I want you to underline this. I want you to highlight this if you haven't done so. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Listen to the word of the Lord. It says this, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. For if you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you may be giving in secret. Then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. I want you to see here that when it comes to money management, it first talks about our heart's posture, our heart's posture, because we can give you the practical things. It's it's almost like telling someone to go play basketball. But if, you're, if your heart's not in it, your passion's not for it, you're not going to want to wake up at 6 a.m. to shoot extra. You're not going to want to stay after practice. You're not going to watch film. It's, it's, it's our heart's posture. So I can give you budgeting sheets, and I can give you all these different things. We can have Zoom calls. I don't know about y'all, but I'm tired of watching folk talk on Zoom. They're, 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 their backgrounds are ugly, right? So it, it, we can have Zoom calls and conversations and all of this. But if you don't actually care if your heart's not in it, we can give you budget sheet after budget sheet after budget sheet. But we're not going to be in it. Jesus talks to us, first of all, we talk about treasures, is where's your heart? Right? So if you want a reward in public, then that's what you're going to get. If you want to have the Father continually reward you, then live your life in the heart, Pastor. So the reasons we are talking about serving money, for there are two things we're tempted to do to keep our hearts away from fully engaging in God. Number one, we are tempted to serve money. Someone say that at your house. I, I've been tempted to serve money. Look at continue. Matthew chapter 6. Go down to verse number 24. Matthew 6, verse number 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The context for this, the reason I read it earlier, is going back to the beginning of Matthew chapter 6. Where's your heart? God is speaking to the impossibility church of divided service. In this case, treating money like money is God. For when I'm serving or in bondage to anything, I'm, in, I'm, I'm listening to and doing whatever the master's telling me to do. So I cannot serve God and serve money. It's impossible, right? The, 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 the result is I incline my ear, my body, my time, my energy to whatever then serves me more. Don't believe me. Go to Romans 6. I'm just giving you all scripture. Go to Romans chapter 6. I hope it's not too much scripture. It's never too much scripture. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Romans 6, verse 16. Look at the word of the Lord. Romans 6, verse 16. It says this. Do you not know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient servants, you are a servant to one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? Putting these two in a conversation, what we see here is it is impossible to serve Two things. I want you to see the one thing that Jesus does in this text. I want you to see this. It's so powerful to me. Jesus does not equate money and having wealth to Satan. Oh, I want you to see this. He he uses the word mammon here. It's it's not the possession of wealth that Jesus condemns because Jesus doesn't condemn the possession of wealth. He was wealthy, right? He doesn't condemn the possession of wealth. He condemns serving money, making money, the idol that I'm serving. God keeps the door open and celebrates when we gather money, use money in the service of God according to the will of God. Because money has a will for you, and God, can I give you this principle? Money promises you what God can provide for you. Oh, that's so good. I said money promises you, money promises you what God can give you. Money promises safety. God provides safety. God, money promises security. God provides security. Money promises protection. God provides Protection. Money promises 
promises wealth. God promises, God provides wealth. Money promises friendship and popularity and love and stature. God gives all and he gives good gifts to his children. Money promises you what God can provide for you. So my question to you, church, is are you leaning on what money promises or are you trusting what God provides? Is your money helping you serve God? Or are you serving your money? I, uh, and I don't, like, you know, answer questions like this. And some of you are looking at me at the screen. Yeah, but Jesse, I have to do, right? What are you talking about? Yes, I bought that thing. I did that thing. I went to this place. And yes, I am serving God by doing that because I just needed to buy that particular thing. I needed to go that uh, yep. When you bought something you didn't need, no, 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 don't, 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 don't tell me you needed it and you used it one time. When you bought, and I've been there too, so I'm not, I'm not saying this from a place of perfection. I'm saying this from a place of growth as well. And it's challenging me in study as well, but I, this is what God told me to talk about. When you bought something you didn't need, you weren't, you didn't buy that because it was going to help you serve God. You bought that because it was going to help, it's you serving money. When you're hoarding stuff, and just hoarding and not using and hoarding and not using and buying and hoarding, you're not serving God with that. You're serving money. When you fight to move up the professional ladder at the expense of your family that you made covenant with, don't call it serving God. It's serving money. Serving money says, watch this, I am going to reposition where the cross is in my life. Ah, Okay, so it, it's like this. It's like this. Um, when we have hymn time at church, it's, 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 it's you're singing like this. So I will cherish my bank account, hallelujah, and my 401k. I will lean into my credit score. Right? When, when you are serving money more than you're serving God, you're singing, what a friend I have in Macy's. Nor Strum Coles and Target too. Right? When when you're when you're trusting money more than you're trusting God, you're singing, I will trust in Nasdaq. I will trust in CNBC money. Oh yes. I will trust in mad money. Until I see a return. Oh, five interest, right? Five percent interest. Right? right we, we're, we're, we're tempted to serve money. It's repositioning the cross in our lives. Hope you all laughed a little bit because I was so off and waiting. Anyway. The second thing we're tempted to do, we're tempted to love money. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm done. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to stay in 1 Timothy and we're going to go home. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're tempted to serve money and we're tempted to love money. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning at verse number 2. These are the things I, you are to teach and insist on, Tim. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree on the sound instruction of the Lord Jesus Christ and the godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people and corrupt mind who have been robbed in the truth, of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Pause here. Look at all of the negative language about people who manipulate because of their love for money. Paul was telling Tim, plant this church. As you plant and grow the church, teach the gospel because there are those who are against the instruction of Jesus and those who are against godly teaching. And the teaching that is against the gospel, look what it does to when you love money. Look what it says here. They are conceited and they understand nothing. They desire controversies and quarrels. They are evil, envious, malicious, evil, and cause friction, and they have been robbed of the truth because they believe that godliness is only a means to financial gain. Paul tells Tim, Tim, I want you to see that when you are in love with money, that's what love of money does. You're a false teacher. Now, a lot of times we just apply this to preachers. We want to apply that as the preachers want to do. I want you to think about your own life. I want you to think about your, your own life as a, as a leader in your household. I want you to think about your, your life, those of you who are managing money for the places you work. I want you to think about the, the ways that you look at money even when you go shopping, right? 
Does money cause you to? I remember growing up, I hated business meetings at my church growing up. I don't know about you. Thumbs up, thumbs, don't do that. I hated business meetings growing up. Growing up. And you know why? Because there are people, I remember our business meetings would be at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. It was like, we did them uh, twice a year or something. So we, our business meetings were 7 o'clock on Wednesday. And there were people, y'all, who never, ever, 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 ever came to Bible study. But when business meeting came, all of a sudden traffic wasn't bad and they made it. They took off work early. I mean, folk would take off days of work to make sure they were ready for to come and 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 just raise first Timothy chapter six. I'm just giving you all scripture, understanding nothing, desire controversy and quarrel. You got to just laugh at it now, because I, I remember one time there was a fight that the church, we, the church I grew up in. We had a fight. I'm just telling you all this because church people are crazy. We had a fight at our church, y'all, about toilet paper. And the funny thing about it was we, the, uh, the janitor at the time, the custodian, the sexton, he had purchased, um, I think, like two ply or three ply. He just got better paper. And the budget for it went up, like, I think, like by $18 over the course of the year. And this one person would not let it die. Just, I don't understand. Well, and then it was funny because then like it was some kid, it was like a, he was a teenager. He was like, man, I just want to have Bible study. So he just went up to the front, gave the pastor $20, went back and sat down. I mean, it's just the funniest things because when we love money or don't understand money and have a bad relationship with money, we'll sit here and have an hour long argument about two ply versus one plot. I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous. Evil, malicious, controversy, quarrel, robs the truth because then godliness is finances. Paul tells Timothy, don't be like that and don't lead a church like that and call it out when you see it. Some of y'all just got really mad at me because you feel like I'm talking about you. And if you think so, then I am. Look at verse number six. But look at what Keith Paul says. That's not funny. Look what Paul says. Look what he says here. <laughs> First Timothy. Everybody, take a moment. Hold on. Wherever you are, let's just laugh for a second because I want you to think about the crazy meetings you've been in. Talk about, buddy. I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm literally done. I just got to laugh a little bit. Some things are funny because we can give scripture to it and realize, man, that was just out of line with the gospel. So everybody just really quickly, I'm sorry, that, that's just, because you think about like how you've been at other meetings. I don't know if you've had, I've been at board meetings where you know the bad board member by the one who's like never touched money before trying to make financial decisions. And it's like, what do you do? Right? So <laughs> look at verse number six. But godliness with contentment is great gain. I'm done. For we brought nothing into the world, and we take nothing from it. If we have food or clothing, be content with that. Those who get rich fall into temptation, a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Look at what the writer here, what Paul is telling him. A lot, I've seen this scripture, and I've read the scripture personally at funerals. We read it down to verse number 9 and leave it. But if you read the whole context of verse number 10, you can see then, so what is the evil that is the root that happens when you love money? Go back to verses 2 through 5, right? That's evil, malicious, friction, conceited, desire. I'm just giving you scripture. So he goes further and says here then, so here's the challenge. Godliness with contentment is the gain you're looking for. Godliness with contentment is the gain you're looking for. God does not desire for you to live in poverty. Have what you have. But if you get rich with the wrong heart, verse 9, You'll fall into traps for loving money is the root of all different types of evil. Go back to verse two through five, right? So money is not a bad thing and money is not a good thing. Have a lot, but don't love it. Earn it, but don't love it. And it's easy. We said, if I were to ask you a question right now, um, if God were to give you the lottery, what would you do with it? And a whole lot of us would say, oh, Pastor Justin, if I got all the money in the world I could think of, I wouldn't have to work as much. I'd be out of debt. I'd give more. I'd serve here. I'd do this. I'd do that. Would you really, though? Because more money makes you more of what, who you already are. If your heart is already out of line with God, more money is not going to make you change the world because you're not trying to do it now where you are with what you have. More money is not going to make you a better Christian. Ah, check your heart. More money won't make you more generous. More money pay, just simply pays you to enrich and create the space for more, for more exposure of what you're already doing. More money won't make you a better Christian. A changed heart is going to make you a better Christian. Free yourself from thinking that more money is going to make you a better person. More money makes you more of who you already are. And the love of money is the root of evil. So don't love money like it, have it, manage it, earn it, engage it, invest it, but don't worship it. Ecclesiastes 5 and 10 put it like this. Whoever loves money 
never has enough, whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. That's meaningless. Many are under money's power and don't even know it. The issue is not how much money you make, it's how much you spend. And a lot of us don't have an income problem, we have a lifestyle problem, your spiritual problem. And what we believe is going to be solved by more money, we're just tethered to it. Money, I told you earlier, promises what God provides. And what you don't really need is more money. You need a little bit more Jesus. Don't believe me. When is the last time you prayed and fasted over being debt free? Yeah, I said what I said. I said, when is the last time you prayed? Not, God, get me to next week. God, help me get some more hours. God, I need another job. God, I hate my boss. God, I can't do this. God, I can't believe it. No, no, when's the last time you prayed and fasted? Because we prayed and fasted over our health and God heals. We pray and fast over getting a job and God gives it. We pray and fast over doing what God and God does it. When's the last time you prayed and fasted, God, give me the wisdom to be debt free? When's the last time you sat and prayed and fasted, hey, God, give me the wisdom and the wherewithal to break generational curses in my family with money? It's not a money problem, it's a lifestyle problem. That's the problem with our world and it just gets coded down to us, and I want to break that curse. It is so, and not otherwise. I told you before, money serves you as you serve God. Money funds your purpose. Money funds your walk with God. Money serves you as you serve God. Can you help me put that in the comments one more time? Money serves me as you can't buy purpose. You live on purpose, and money serves you you. If you don't believe me, I conclude with the words of Paul. And I want you to highlight this. I want you to underline this. I want you to own this. I want you to own this. If you want to know, Pastor Justin, if, if, if money serves me as I serve God, how do I serve God? I'm just going to give you a scripture. Look at 1 Timothy um, and go down to verse number 11. And it says these words, but you man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and endurance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses in the sight of God who gives light to everything and of Jesus Christ who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession I charge to you. So keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in the unapproachable light, whom no one has ever can or will see. To him be glory and honor forever. Amen. Look what the text tells us. He tells Timothy to do, to pursue a relationship with God, to imitate the Savior, to find faith in the divine, to have a love for others, to endure the gospel fight, and to be humble. I want you to take a moment, I'm, as I conclude here, and as we, that's my fourth conclusion. Um, I want you to take a moment, and I want you to highlight or underline any words that sit out to you in this text. I want you to be mindful. I'm, I'm on this camera. I'm on the second camera. I want you to be mindful of what God is saying to you. I want you to be intentional about what God is saying to you. Where are the places in your life when we talk about serving God that you can honestly say, like, Pastor Justin, I'm not serving God in that way. I'm not pursuing righteousness. I'm not pursuing godliness. I'm not trying to imitate the Father. I told you before, wealth is not a bad thing. Worshiping wealth is. What is God telling you in that text? Spend more time, I want you to spend more time searching for what God says in God's word than you do spending time trying to find another job or trying to be affirmed by people who don't even love you in the first place. Money serves me as I serve God. Are you serving God? That's the question. Are you, are you serving God as I... As I prayed over this, sought the Lord for this moment, I, we'll get into budget sheets and we'll have, a, we'll have a Zoom call and we'll do all of that. But I want to confront um, our hearts when it comes to money. Are you spending more time searching for a job than you are reading scripture on God's word? Like when is honestly the last time you have prayed and fasted? Like this Lent to create a lifestyle should be fasting to be debt free so that you create a debt free lifestyle, have debt free vision, 
This, this Lent can be an opportunity for you to pray and fast for 40 days, for God to open up your eyes to what it really means to have an abundance mindset and trust in God so that when Lent is over, you have an abundance lifestyle that now is pursuing to not live paycheck to paycheck, pursuing not to have debt own me and not be swallowed by debt. serving God. Because let me tell you what scripture shows us and what God promises. God will position you where you can serve God. For some of you, I want to I want to free you and God was very clear to me about this. I'm going to be very blunt with it. Quit the job search because God is challenging you first to, sh to, to serve him where you are and he'll open the door. If the door needs to be open. I said what I said. God is challenging you to serve. He's not telling you to take beneath your value. But God is saying, you're not honoring me where you are. So why would I, excuse me, why would God open up a new door if you ain't serving him where you are? Oh my God, some of you got mad at me. But you can think of right now the opportunities in your life to serve God on the job. You can't stand your job. But God says, you haven't brought me to your job. So your relationship with money, you're living paycheck to paycheck, you hate your boss, hate everything, your emotions are out of balance, and God says, pause, serve me, and I guarantee your emotions will come back. What sort of things are lovely, pure, true, if anything is praiseworthy, excellent, think on those things. You can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. No weapon formed against you will prosper because you've allowed your job to be a weapon that's been formed, and God says, because you're not trusting me, you're on the battlefield at work. Oh, I said what I said. God will position you to share the gospel because money serves you to be a follower of Christ and you don't serve money. Every hand is lifted just wherever you are. Every hand is lifted wherever you are and I want you to be in a receiving position. I hope this blessed you today. I want you to be in a receiving position. I want those of you who need to pray these particular prayers, there's four prayers I want to give you today. If you need to pray these, I want you to pray these. First, first prayer is, God, give me the wisdom to be debt-free. Come on, I, I, I really want you to pray this. God, give me the wisdom to be debt-free. I'm going to say it one more time because some of you are too afraid to say it out loud. But I want you to own this. Come on, I want you to scream it out to God. I want you to write this in your journal. God, give me the wisdom to be debt-free. It is so. The hand is still lifted. God, break curses of generational poverty in my family. Come on. God, break curses of generational poverty in my family. We're going to pray one more time. God, break curses of generational poverty in my family. Hallelujah. That hand is still lifted in a receiving position. God, give me an abundance mindset. God, give me an abundance mindset. God, last prayer, allow my money to not be my God. Allow my money to not be my God. God, we honor you. God, we thank you today that you have such a unique and amazing way of allowing us to engage in your word, allowing us to engage in who you are so that we are not dominated by the things of this world, but we can engage with you. So, Father, I pray now in the name of Jesus that you enrich our relationship with you so that nothing will distance us or cause us to be distant from you that your word overwhelms us, your peace consumes us, and that your joy, God, is everlasting. I pray now, God, in the areas of our lives where you're calling us to serve you, that you give us the space and the grace to serve you in spirit and in truth, and that money never becomes our God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're here today, you don't have a relationship with God, I pray that this moment for you, we talk about serving God, that you can take time to 
really engage holistically in what it means to serve the Father and to serve God. Um, if you're looking for a church home, this is a great place. We'd love for you to grow with us. Church, over the course of the next couple weeks, like I said in a moment, um, when service is over, um, there'll be a break in that moment. You can grab your journal again, and Court's going to actually have a moment to talk it over, talk the sermon over with you, and to engage with you as to what this means and what this means for you and next steps for you when it comes to being someone who serves the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, I, um, I pray this in Christ. We're going to be in this for four weeks. And we'll see where God takes us the four weeks. But I want you to grab this first week. Money serves you as you serve God. We're going to take a moment for communion. So please ready your hearts and your minds for communion. We're going to have a worship song play for a moment to give us time to prepare our hearts and our minds for it. And then we're going to jump into communion. And then following communion, we will finally announce everything clearly about, about Easter, how you can connect with Easter, how you can find more information about it, and how you can even volunteer for Easter as well. But you got to get through communion with us. So grab your elements, your, uh, your, your red juice and your, um, your cracker, whatever that is for you. Grab that and we'll celebrate the body of the Lord Jesus Christ together. God bless you.
we just want you. We just want you. Oh, yeah. we just want you. We just want you, God. We just want you. We just want you, God. We just want you. We just want you. We just want you. We just want you. Well, welcome back to worship, everybody. I pray you guys were impacted by our sermon and impacted by worship. What's something that stood out to you, Court? My money served me. I don't serve my money. <laughs> um, I learned the Lord is where the money resides. Hey. Right? Serving the Lord is where the, the money. <laughs> um, it is communion time. And one of the reasons I wanted to start off with some sort of laughter is... When we talk about communion, I think communion often is seen as this somber and very, very serious moment. Um, Instead of really being a moment of community, Jesus was breaking bread with 11 people that, well, 12 people that he loved, one that didn't really love him back, and 11 that would go start a church. It was a beautiful moment. And for Jesus, he was at the crux of purpose. And while his humanity was saddened and frustrated, his divinity was excited. He has fulfilled purpose. And communion for us, I want to be a moment like that where you are communing with Jesus because you're in purpose. You're fulfilling what God has called you to do. You're doing what God has called you to do. And yes, there may be moments you don't like, but as I said earlier today, it is simply stretching you to test your capacity, to test your trust. And so let this communion moment be a be a fun, engaging moment. You are sitting across from Jesus. Engage with him. You are sitting next to Jesus. Rejoice that you are in proximity to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we commune today, um, I want to honor the presence of the Lord today. And uh, we're welcome to sit with Jesus today. So no matter what elements you have, we have the elements that were distributed yesterday at the drive through communion. Um, we have our grape juice as well as our crackers here. Whatever you have, whenever you desire, you can feel free to grab a hold of. Um, really, it's just a reminder to us of the body of Christ and reminder to us of the blood of Christ. So grab that communion element if you would. There is actually gluten. Well, there's all things in heaven. So I you were saying is there a gluten? There is gluten-free communion uh, elements, actually. Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, there's, I mean, it's a true thing. There really is. Um, and sugar-free grape juice. Well, I don't. Look into that. No. Okay. So <laughs> Jesus was sitting with his disciples, and as he was sitting with his disciples, he took the he took the bread and he broke it, and he was sharing with them that his body was going to be broken. But he was going to, the body was going to be broken for them. It's a beautiful thing to be reminded and to be engaged and be told by Jesus that the things that crush him are going to encourage and enlighten us. And I think all of us can be encouraged today that when we look at 2020, look at the beginning of 21, 20, 2021, anything that you feel has broken you, Jesus has already solved and put back together again. So may this be a reminder that nothing is so broken that Jesus won't find a way to use it for purpose. God, use this to push us where you need us, where we can meet you where you already are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take eat the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine sitting at the table with the Judas, sitting at the table with Peter and all these other disciples who would run. Just don't want to beat up Peter. Peter's just the one we got the story told of, and I think because he had a really interesting relationship with John, but all the disciples besides John ran away from Jesus. Imagine sitting at a table where you know eventually you're going to tell them they're going to leave you. They're going to forsake you. And I feel like all of us have been there before, but yet Jesus still says, no matter what, I've empowered you with my body. and I've empowered you with the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The good news is of the gospel is not that we can get to God, but that God through Christ Jesus comes to us and that you can never be so far from God that God won't bring you back to his, 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 his presence. So may this be a reminder that those of you who feel far from God, those of you who feel distant from God, even as we talked about money earlier, those of you who feel like you're serving money, you can serve God and God still draws you back to his presence. And may this be a representation, a reminder that Jesus wants to draw you closer. God, use this that we might be empowered and encouraged by your blood and your power to be what you need us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take drink the blood of the Lord. In that manner, the Bible says they sung a hymn and went on to the highways and byways. And the purpose of communion is to go. So here's my challenge to you. I want you to do one thing for somebody this week. I said, I want you to do something for someone. There's a 
initiative that we're taking under based upon something my wife told me about called heart attacks. Do you want to explain heart attacks on a door? Oh. <laughs> it's different things that I see. Um, so yeah, so a heart attack, are it's a really cool thing and really cool to get your kids involved if you have kids, but simply it's just grabbing sheets of paper. You can cut them in heart shapes, it can be post-it notes, regular printer paper, line paper, whatever, and just pick a neighbor, pick a community member, whatever it is, someone that you know will probably really need it and just write kind words about them. Get your kids involved and just say like, you know, you are special, you're gonna make it through, or I really love this about you, I miss you, I love you, whatever. And you just go to their door and you just type it on their door. You don't have to ring the doorbell, you don't have to knock, you don't have to say anything other than just Tape, tape it on the door and when they open their door they'll have a heart attack and be attacked by your love and it's super simple it's fun to do as a family um, and it will make somebody's day we're just doing something so simple as that that's it so I want you to go out into the highways and byways and build the church not this church but God's church through you living on purpose by doing something for someone and uh, let communion live in you now we're finished, uh, but we have a big announcement for Easter. I'm ready for this. Are you ready for this? I kind of alluded to it last week, but I'm excited. So we were praying about Easter. We were going to have service inside of the sanctuary and then outside and then outside and all of that. We were thinking about doing a drive-in and all of that. So I reached out to our partner at uh, Hope High School about being a, a weather um, place in case we needed to drive in. You guys don't care about the explanation. We're going to have church at Hope High School. That's, that's what we come to. Y'all, I'm sitting here about to give y'all the whole story. Yeah, I was like, this is the strategy we had to deal with and the frustration. So we're going to have church in the auditorium, Hope High School. We can spread out six feet. No, you're be six feet. So we're going to spread out and, and have church. There'll be one service, 11 o'clock, on Easter Sunday morning. Amen. One service, 11 o'clock, Easter Sunday morning at Hope High School in the auditorium. We'll have one big shebang. Outside of service, there'll be a photo booth for you to get free Easter portraits. Hallelujah. So get your Easter best on. Or, you know, and some of you can't fit the stuff you're going to wear last year. And so get your Easter best T-shirt, whatever it is. I think I'm going to get a shirt made that says, this is my Easter shirt. I don't know. No, don't do that. Okay. I, I know. Me and themed T-shirts and hoodies. So we're going to have Easter there at 11 o'clock um, at Hope High School. And um, all of that will be inside. Um, we'll, we'll be on the website, congenstreet.org backslash Easter today, count it today, is where you can start registering for Easter. We have a max capacity of people because of all of the different different logistics we have to, to, to deal with as well. That's absolutely fine. Um, so we'll live stream it as well. There'll be a live stream service on Easter, in-person service on Easter. And if we see we have like capacity immediately Immediately, we'll make plans for it because we want to make sure we can engage with the Lord Jesus Christ. What we'll do after that, um, let's get to Easter first and we'll, we'll decide all of that. But I'm excited about worshiping and seeing your faces in a place where we can worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. We've been running with it and planning and I'm excited about the next steps for us to worship God at uh, together in person at Hope High School uh, for Easter Sunday morning on the first Sunday of April. Come on, if you're excited, come on, let's see your favorite GIF or emoji. I'm excited about this. Are you excited? Yeah. I'm excited to save souls. Excited to, we're going to baptize the day before. So here's the thing. If you wish to rededicate your life or to participate in baptism, here's what I need you to do. We have a process for baptism. We're not going to do it on that Sunday. We're going to do it the Saturday before and share it on Sunday. Hear me. Saturday before. Share it on Sunday. So if you are interested in baptism, I need you to go to congressstreet.org and on the front page of it, it says baptism and just go there. Give us your information and we will follow up with you. congressstreet.org, click baptism. Give us your info. We'll follow up with you. And what that'll give us a chance to do is like we, we have a process for baptism to keep you safe. The COVID way of being safe. Can I tell them the COVID way? No. They okay. Have to you have to be baptized and renewed. Yes, we do. We went, I flew to Sea of Galilee and I've been quarantining. I'm kidding. Uh, but no, so we have a, we, we, we figured out, walk through ways that we can keep it safe. So for baptisms, we're going to do it. We're going to record it. You can bring um, like two or three family members. But those of you who do sign up for baptism, we will let you know all of the information. 
do baptism the day before Easter, show it on Easter Sunday morning so everybody can see it and go forward. I'm excited about the entire weekend we'll do. Um, it's gonna take a lot of planning, so where can you participate on the Easter website? There's a place for volunteering. If you wanna help with volunteering, there's logistics, directing people inside the building, directing people outside, making sure that if we reach our capacity, no one can come in, if people haven't signed up. Like, you know, first come, first, first come first, not first come first serve, first register, first serve and then above and beyond that. So we're just really excited about um, Easter Sunday morning. Um, we knew we like just even just having, um, I'm giving you all this explanation. I don't, I, I don't really care. So Easter 11, be in the place on Easter. There's no particular theme other than he is risen. He is risen indeed. And I'm excited to celebrate Jesus. All right. That's our big announcement. Got a month to register, a month to get ready, a month to get your Easter best, a month to work out, to fit into your outfits and, and all of that. And like I said, we have free photos. There'll be something for kids, a puppet show during worship for our kiddos. You have puppets. Our kids will be a part of worship. Um, our, our, our praise team, dance team, everybody. I'm looking forward to uh, celebrating Easter together with all of you. All right. So that's worship today. I pray you guys are blessed and encouraged to be who God's called you to be, had a chance to celebrate each other, yeah. right? Had a chance to honor each other. Now, um, we're going to take a break here after we finish. It'll be like 30 seconds. Grab your journals, whatever it is. Court's going to lead a session called Talk It Over. If you want to participate, you don't have to, but um, called Talk It Over. And it's simply diving deeper into what we preached on. And maybe there was something said or sung, not sung, said, said or engaged with that you want to dive more into, think about deeper. Court's going to ask you some questions, lead you through some questions, some ways in your devotional that can assist you um, to lean further into um, this whole understanding of money, money management, and wisdom with your finances. So um, with that being said, may God keep you. May the grace of God be around you. May the peace of God consume you. May the love of God be everywhere you need it to be. And may God be God to you this week. Have a wonderful week. God bless you. that you guys enjoyed service. So a new component that we're gonna add to some of the service, especially ones like this, um, based on the sermon series, God cares more about your money than you do, is a talk it over. So this is a chance where um, it's one thing to kind of hear it and kind of ingest it. And now that you've probably written notes about it and you've had time to kind of think it through um, and let it marinate, it's really cool if we could just talk it over. Um, that's one of the cool things about small groups too, where you go and you take a text and even the sermon from past Sundays um, in the word of God, and you can actually walk through people who are just like you from women's group to um, young adult group, the men's group. And it's really great because you have similar experiences to the people that you attend small groups with. And so you can talk it over. So all together, as we've heard the same sermon, it's important that we can see like, now how do I digest this? What is practical? And what are the key takeaways that I got that the Holy Spirit is showing me in my life so that I can make sure that the word of God does not fall on deaf ears, but it's planted in fertile soil so that it can grow and blossom into what God has always intended it for it to be. So the purpose and the main point of Pastor Justin's sermon is where the money reside. Hey, I'm just saying. <laughs> Have you guys seen that GIF? Have you guys seen that? I, I think it's so funny. But one of the biggest things that I think it resonated with all of us is because we are in this culture of like manifestation, right? And there's nothing wrong with manifesting, right? But it's doing the work changing the mindsets and having a heart change that's what leads to the manifest manifestation so it's not like you know the vibes and the aura that you're setting in place yes that's a part of it but bigger it's your actions, your lifestyles, your your mentality, your mind towards it, your heart towards it. And so the big point that Pastor Justin was saying that we don't serve money. We serve God and money serves us as we serve God. 
right? And so really it's aligning and it's asking, and if you have a journal, that's awesome. You have your phone. I love using my phone notes. They're just great handy dandy to like write on the go. You can always access them on all your devices. So use your notes, use your journal, whatever you have that's available um, to use that. So really, like I said, Pastor Justin's main point is we don't serve money. We serve God and our money serves us as we serve God. Um, and that's, that is where the money resides, in serving God, in serving God. One of the bigger things that I think that I was even convicted in in this sermon and in this in this service where, yeah, like, you know, God, you know, we have student loan debt, there's mortgage, there's there's debt. God, like, get us out of debt so we can live freely. But then realizing that some of that was, like, self-serving. Like, you know, I just want to be free for debt so I could just go on just vacations and relax. But what is it in it? that is serving God. Yes, God desires for us to rest. God desires for us to have an abundant life. God desires, I do not believe that when God created this world, when God created um, us in the beginning and he said that this is good, that he said, okay, but I want them to um, slave and to toil and to not have an abundant life. No, when he created us in the beginning of time, he wanted us to have an abundant life, right? And it's working the system. God is not surprised by our, our society, by our capitalistic society. God is not like, oh, shoot, I forgot. In 2021, everything's about to go up by like 20%. Groceries are going to be a lot. Energy costs, gas going to go through the roof. Oh, yeah, I forgot. No, he did not forget. But the thing that remains the same is our heart's posture towards serving God versus our heart's posture towards serving money. And where does that lie? And I think, right, it's a good time in your personal journals and even now to say, realistically, whether it looks good or it looks bad, where is your heart's posture? I love the question that Pastor Justin asked in the sermon where he said, if you won the lottery, what would you do? If you won the lottery, what is that one thing that comes to your mind first? What is that one thing that you're like, this is what I would do? Does it change you as a person in terms of getting closer to God, helping God's people, being an ambassador for God in this world, or does it serve yourself? And these are real questions that have real answers. Um, and so wherever you are, we have to have a marker on wherever we are so that that's what we work towards. So say like, God, what is it? Search my heart. This is what David said. God, search my heart. If there is anything in me, and this is right now, this is what we're doing. God, search my heart. What is in me and how is my relationship with money? Um, so what's one idea? You can write this in the comments if you want to share. What's one idea that stood out to you? What's, what's something that you really enjoyed um, or something that you hadn't thought about before um, that you thought about after Pastor Justin's sermon? Like, let's hear that. Um, we can really help each other as we learn and grow. What is something that helped you in the sermon? <clears throat> I like that. So as we wrap up, um, Pastor Justin gave a number of, of scriptures, right? Pastor Justin gave a number of things. Um, and even before I give you some more scriptures to meditate on throughout the week, it's asking yourself, okay, what's my relationship with money? Who can I talk to um, to help me organize my money better if that's something that you want to do? And how do I better align myself to say, is my money serving me so I can serve God? Like, what's my relationship with it? Is it prior generational curses? Like, uh, has your mother or father been bad with money, their mother and father, their mother and father, and you just, it's just been passed down year after year, or, or very, or vice versa. 
where you've probably, or maybe you've grown up with lots of money, but God was nowhere near. Or maybe you've had a balanced life with money. How can you help others who don't? How is God using your um, financial literacy and your financial capabilities to help those around you? That every gift that we have is not just for us. It's not for us to just self-consume and for us to serve us. It's for us to help to serve other people so that they can see God in a mighty way. Life is hard, and COVID has done a number on our world. It's done a number on um, our finances, whether you've lost a job and you're just trying to make it from day to day, week to week, month to month. Maybe your job is doing very well, and your job has actually grown because of COVID, and you are able to be in a better position to give of yourself and to serve God better. No matter where we find ourselves, we still need to have a healthy relationship when it comes to God and when it comes to our money. That money talk in church should not just be the hands of who stole money today, what pastor did this today, but a healthy conversation with money is saying that I am prepared I am prepared for today. I am prepared for tomorrow because my money serves me as I serve God and is being bold. And I declare that in your life. I declare that in your mind, that your money will serve you as you serve God. I hope this talking over uh, really helped you. Small group leaders, feel free to take um, these questions and some of these things. I'm going to give you some scriptures to meditate on in just a second, but feel free to take these things and um, have an intro in your lessons um, throughout the month as you go through these things so that we can reiterate these things. So a couple of scriptures to meditate on. The first is Matthew 6, verse 19 through 24. Write these down, maybe like Monday or Tuesday or even tonight. Meditate on this and write down what God is saying. Pastor Justin used these in his sermon as well, and they're also in you version. First um, Timothy 6, 6 through 10. And the last scripture was Ecclesiastics 5, 10. So these are helpful scriptures to really help. Um, an idea that you took away and just really being honest, being honest with God. God is not surprised by where you are. God is not impressed by our lip service. He reads our hearts. He knows your bank account. He knows your debt. God is not surprised. God is an, a very in tune God. And so we have to let him in to say, show us our heart. Show us the dark spots of our heart so that you can come in and make all things new and make all things right. And that's the hope of Jesus Christ. So I hope that you enjoyed this Talk It Over. Share it with somebody, text it out. Listen, this is where the money reside, okay? Your money is here to serve you as you serve God. So pray with me as we end this time. God, thank you for such a relevant and on-time word. God, we thank you that nothing or anything that has to do with us is a surprise to you. God, you know everything about us. God, reveal to us our heart on where we stand between our relationship with you and our relationship with money. God, help organize and get straight the things that we need to get straight. God, help us to see a way that we can work so that we can allow our money to serve us as we serve you. Forgive us, God, in all the ways that we have worshiped money over for worshiping you. Forgive us for the times that we fantasize or daydream on the things that we can get instead of saying, God, how can we help to bless our community? We thank you, God, that you desire for us to have great things. You desire for us to rest. You desire for us to be well provided for, God. We thank you for that time. God, we ask you that you heal our nation, that you heal this world, that you heal our land, that you heal our economy, that you heal our jobs, that you give us not just work, but purpose in our work, God. We thank you, God. We thank you that your, our Holy Spirit is giving language right now.
Holy Spirit is giving language right now to those that need it, God, that to vocalize exactly what they want to do, God. God, I pray financial gain in jobs, not just jobs that they have to do, but jobs that they are passionate to do, jobs that you have purposed them to do, that they get joy in working, they get joy in their money, as we serve you and that they bring you into every space, God, because you have purposed us with a gift in it. God, thank you for the freedom. Thank you for the generational curses that are broken even today, that our children's children don't have to go through the same things that we or our parents or our forefathers have gone through. God, we thank you for such a sound pastor. We thank you for sound word. And we thank you that your word is relevant today as it was yesterday, as it was before, and it will be forevermore. Thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.